uh, about 10 years ago when we started to work in this, we found that when you try to formulate porphyrins into liposomes, as has been done before in this commercial formulation, commercial formulation called Visudyne, what ends up happening is that uh, the liposomes don't form properly. That's these molecules here. This is a very common pharmaceutical carrier that's formed from lipids. And you end up with a very limiting amount of porphyrin in the, in the liposome, and also it doesn't remain stably embedded. And so we have a model where the his tag is inserting into the bilayer, and here you're looking at one leaflet of the bilayer, and kind of anchoring the whole protein or peptide directly into the liposome bilayer. And so it is known that cobalt, uh, when it coordinates with another molecule, it becomes very inert and stable. So it's almost irreversible binding, at least in biological conditions. We have a paradigm now where we can take a preformed peptide and our preformed liposomes, and we just mix them together. And that will cause the protein or peptide to bind to the liposomes and kind of form a particle in a very simple and straightforward way. So here is cryo-EM images done by uh, Wahim Ortega in McGill University, also in Canada. And you can see here that the liposomes alone are shown in the lower left. So these are liposomes that contain a small amount, about seven molar percent of cobalt porphyrin phospholipid or COPOP. And the other lipids are kind of just conventional liposomes, lipids used in liposome formulations such as cholesterol or DPPC or DOPC. And then on the right, we've taken those liposomes and incubated them with an HIV uh, trimeric protein that we've got from Scripps uh, Research Institute in California, uh, working with Richard Wyatt. And we just mixed them together and we didn't carry out any further purifications. And you can see that these large trimers are able to bind to the surface of the liposomes and kind of present in a viral mimetic fashion. And so this was done without any further purification. So it's an essentially a quite an easy way to take a well-characterized recombinant protein and convert it into a particle. And this is done in just a couple of hours. And so when we originally started this work, we, we didn't realize that in the vaccine development field, there is quite an interest in particle-based vaccines. Uh, and so over the past, you know, five or less years, we've kind of been applying this technology more and more to vaccines. So now in our lab at UB, uh, quite soon. Another interesting point about this approach that we've observed is that we do get very durable immune responses. So here we're looking at two different antigens. This was studies done by two separate people in our group. And they both showed that you get extended antibody duration with nanogram dosing. These are both 100 nanogram doses uh, primed and boost in mice. And then we just follow the antibody response and we see that we get a durable response for over 250 days. So we haven't gone out this far with our SARS-CoV-2 work, but that is obviously a concern in terms of generating uh, COVID-19 vaccine for antigens and simply mix it with your COPOP lipsome that is preformed lipsomes, preformed and prepared, pre-prepared antigens. And that is able to bind all of the antigens and form a multivalent particle uh, that we showed in this case uh, forms glycine. So now we're finally going to get into the COVID, uh, our work on COVID, which was just published recently. So, so we next did a study in mice. So this was a relatively quick study. We immunized outbred mice on day zero and on day 14, and then we collected the serum on day 28. And the dose we used was just 100 nanograms of RBD. We actually did this study with both the mammalian RBD and also the insect RBD, and the results were, were quite similar. And that, that was published in the manuscript. So we characterized the resulting antibody quality in terms of a few different factors. So one, we looked at the ELISA binding titers. And we can see here the adjuvants are listed on the bottom. So we can see the COPOP groups have about, you know, one, I should say two to three orders of magnitude higher uh, IgG magnitude compared to the other adjuvants. So this is a, a pattern that we saw with the malaria antigen that I showed on a few slides ago, PFS25, where we showed that 
you know, we have a very strong hapton effect and that conversion into a particle is really beneficial. So I would say that's the same pattern that we see here. And, you know, based on our experience with this adjuvant, by no means do all antigens behave in this way. Only some of them do, those ones that tend to be hapton-like. So we were excited about this result because it showed that the RBD really benefits from this adjuvant and the RBD is a very um, promising antigen. So I just, you know, point your attention to the bottom here. So when you have the identical lipsomes that lack cobalt, so all the components are, are identical, you can see the difference in terms of how much of a difference uh, when you mix those, the antigen with the adjuvant that converts it into particles and treat everything the same way, you can see, you know, a couple orders of magnitude higher immune response at least. And the other adjuvants also were very ineffective. And these other adjuvants are not able to convert the RBD into a particle. We also looked at uh, pseudovirus in, uh, neutralization. So using a pseudovirus system that uh, expresses the spike protein, we showed that the antibodies we induced were able to potently neutralize the pseudovirus compared to all the other adjuvants. And finally, we used a commercial kit uh, from GenScript called CPAS that is essentially uh, a mechanism to look at the disruption of the RBD with the ACE2. And so that can measure that interaction and, and antibodies that block that interaction. And we showed here that, again, only the COPOP, the adjuvant that, that contained COPOP were able to induce those uh, antibodies that blocked the interaction between ACE2 and uh, RBD effectively. So we then uh, collaborated with some people at Penn State University who have, who have done this assay in, um, and have a very kind of qualified assay worked out. And we looked at the actual live virus neutralizing titers. And what we found was that compared to alum, uh, the COPOP adjuvant was very effective at inhibiting the um, virus replication in cells. And so the neutralizing titers were at the maximum threshold of the assay. And unfortunately, I don't have it on this figure, but it's in the, the manuscript, that published manuscript, if, you are, if you're interested. Uh, neutralizing titers for con human convalescent sera come in around this level, around 100 or so. And we, we also showed, that's the median. So we also showed the interquartile range. And so 75% of the range of 75% of human sera, human convalescent sera is around, I believe it's somewhere around this like 200 to 20 range. So we achieved in mice with 100 nanogram dosing uh, antibody titers that are, are much more potent uh, and very functional much more potent than antibodies induced with other adjuvants. So uh, this, this slide contains the key data, I would say, on the ASO1 adjuvant. Um, we also showed that uh, germinal B cells are formed uh, with statistically higher amount compared to other adjuvants. And also T follicular helper cells are as well. Uh, we also looked at the um, cellular, cellular response, uh, looking at immunized mice and checking their splenocytes. And then what we did is we took their splenocytes, cultured them, re-stimulated with antigen, and uh, checked for interferon gamma production, shown in the left. And also we checked for uh, cytokine producing T cells uh, based on um, intracellular cytokine staining after re-stimulation. So, so this data is kind of showing that, uh, but this slide is just showing reactogenicity measured by a foot pad swelling assay. So we see that compared to the other adjuvants, uh, we don't see any enhanced foot pad swelling. And when we looked at immunized mice, this foot pad swelling is in mice. And when we looked at immunized mice with respect to their weight change, we didn't see any statistical differences. And again, as I mentioned, this was using um, a dose that for using cobalt porphyrin type molecules because vitamin B12 is a kind of a corn type of macrocycle, very similar to the cobalt, uh, cobalt porphyrins. And vitamin B12 has an excellent safety record and it's been used intravenously in humans. At, uh, we also are interested in translating this technology. We've been working actually with a Korean company called U Biologics 
on on this technology and and they've shown in a lot of interest and they're actually developing this into a COVID vaccine uh, and we hope to start first clinical trials soon um, so so that's been extremely exciting we've actually made uh, we've been making the COPOP under GMP conditions we're not done yet but we're hopefully going to be complete that really soon because it's needed to keep things on track with this uh, clinical trial that might happen in Korea very soon with you biologics. So, so that's been extremely exciting for us um, to be working on that and to be working with you biologics to kind of bring this promising data uh, 